Hello, we've looked at operating systems as one of our examples of systems software. And the other real main example of system software are utilities. So utilities or utility software to use that different term are programs which help maintain the computer by performing housekeeping tasks. Now I must say the phrase housekeeping tasks isn't a phrase I particularly like, but it's what OCR often use in mark schemes and the specification. Housekeeping in real life are the kind of cleaning jobs you do to maintain a house and look after it and keep things in tip top shape. And utilities are doing those sort of jobs or the equivalent jobs on a computer system. The unglamorous jobs which help look after it, help ensure it's running smoothly over time. You know, maintenance is all about ensuring things are working as time progresses. Now, an operating system, to be honest, does a lot of these maintenance jobs. It does a huge amount of stuff for us to help the computer run smoothly. But you might also install standalone utilities, which are separate programs made by different companies that carry out tasks not done by your operating system. Now, there are loads and loads and loads of examples of utilities. So backup software would be one. We've learned about firewalls and anti-malware in the security topic, but these, although are often built into an OS, you could download a separate firewall, a separate anti-malware as a standalone utility. And for example, if you're converting file types, that would also be a utility. So there are four examples of utilities, which are ones which are not necessarily ones you have to know about in this topic. There are three listed by OCR under this topic, but I want you to be aware of the fact that there are lots more examples beyond the three we're going to look at. So the first two are ones we've basically covered already elsewhere in the course. So I won't spend too long talking about these. The first example is data compression software. So as you hopefully know by now, compression is trying to reduce the file size of a file. And we do this so if we can store more files on our storage, but also so if we can transfer files quicker over a network. And an operating system typically will have built-in compression tools. Here is me highlighting some files in Windows, right-clicking, and you can see there's a compress to option and that lets me create a zip file which is a type of lossless compression so that's built into an os but also i've downloaded a separate utility called winrar which you might have heard of you might have used yourself so this is just a set of tools in addition to what windows provides so here i've first of all chosen what files i want to compress by highlighting and right clicking and then it will let me choose certain settings it might let me choose which algorithm to use Let's me do a few different tweaks to what I'm doing and it maybe adds a few more tools compared to Windows. Windows doesn't give me a choice to do some of these specific things, but WinRAR as a standalone utility gives me some more options. The second of the three examples you are expected to know about is encryption software. Again, we've covered encryption in the security topic. So encryption is where we are trying to make files very, very difficult to understand for anybody who is unauthorized, anybody who hasn't got access to the decryption key. So it's just gibberish, it's just scrambled up unless you've got access to the key and you can decrypt the data. So it doesn't prevent interception, but it prevents somebody understanding it who doesn't have access to the key. And again, this is kind of built into Windows or Mac OS or various different OSs. You also might choose to install kind of more specialist software. Veracrypt is one of the many, many examples of standalone utilities, which could provide some more settings compared to what your OS might provide. It allows you to do stuff like select which file you want, maybe a whole folder, maybe a whole hard drive. It lets you choose which algorithm you want to use. There are lots of different types of encryption algorithms, some better than others, some slower than others. And most importantly, you've got to be able to set an encryption key so that only you know how to decrypt and actually understand what is being encrypted. So those first two are hopefully a bit straightforward if you've covered those concepts already. But the next one, defragmentation software, takes a bit more explanation. So so before we get on to what defragmentation software is, we need to talk about what fragmentation is. So fragmentation relates to hard drives, our magnetic hard drives. And computers which have hard drives can become fragmented over time, especially as they fill up, especially as you reach near full capacity. So if we kind of took out the metal covering, inside a hard drive is a disk. This disk spins really, really fast and the data is distributed on the disk's surface, stored using different magnetisms. And all of this movement is key to understanding why fragmentation is an issue. So how can a disk become fragmented and what does that mean? Well, let's say this is representing the surface of the disk. As I save files, I'm taking up some of these blocks. So this first orange file is worth four blocks, it could be four gigabytes or something like that. 
Well, as I keep adding programs and files, it fills up normally. And some are bigger than others, some are quite small, but I can fill up the disk relatively normally. But inevitably, I'm going to eventually start deleting certain files. So this pink file has been deleted, leaving two blocks free. Now, that's not necessarily an issue right now because I can keep adding more files in at the bottom where I have still got capacity. If I did this blue one here and this green one, and maybe after this point, I delete this kind of orangey one at the start. So if this is the current state of my hard drive, it's pretty full. So I'm pretty near capacity here. And because I've deleted some programs or some files, it's left some gaps. And the issue is these gaps then need to get filled up. If I, for example, have quite a big file being saved, maybe it takes up eight blocks. Well, I've not got eight blocks in a row. So I'm going to need to split up this eight block program across multiple different locations. So I've just got to fill it up. I haven't really got much choice here. I either don't save it or I just break it apart. And that's what fragmentation is. It's where a file gets split up across multiple locations on the hard drive's surface. So in reality, this first fragment could be right at the top. This next one could be on the side. This next one could be right across the other side. And that's a massive issue because the disk is having to spin to get to these locations. So when it was stored in one block, it didn't have to really move very far to be able to read all of these different blocks. But when I'm splitting it up across multiple locations, it now has to rotate round to get to each location. And that takes time. It doesn't move fast, but ultimately this is wasted time. So when files are fragmented, they take longer to read or write because time is wasted moving the disk into each different position. So the computer feels a lot slower because it's having to do a lot more work to read or write this file. Now it's important to realize that actually this is only really a problem for hard drives because they have moving parts. SSDs are used a lot now as secondary storage. They can also get fragmented. They can have files getting split up, especially as they near capacity. But because nothing is moving inside an SSD, we can still read fragmented files with almost the exact same speed as if they were stored together. So despite getting fragmented, it's not an issue in terms of speed because we've got no moving parts. Now, CDs are optical storage. They do move. They've got moving parts. However, a CD doesn't really ever have this issue because we are never, ever, ever going to be using a CD as secondary storage. We're never going to be writing and deleting and writing again with the same regularity as a hard drive. So basically these don't really get affected either. Fragmentation only affects hard drives. So because hard drives aren't being used as much anymore, this won't really be a problem for much longer, I would say. You may never be affected by this problem. But we still need to know about defragmentation software. So this is software trying to fix this issue, trying to help maintain our computer to make it run a bit more smoothly. So this utility will rearrange the hard drive so that each file is stored as close together as possible. It essentially shuffles stuff around so that it is stored ideally in one block. And the impact after the software runs is that it will speed up the reading and writing on average. It may not affect every single reading or writing operation, but it will hopefully affect enough to speed up your computer. So we take a fragmented hard drive like this one where I've got this purple file in three different locations and it will I try and rearrange it so that it is stored together so the disk isn't having to move as much to read or write. And because SSDs are much more prevalent now, we don't really use defragmentation software as often. Here is an example picture of a defragger utility, which kind of has a similar diagram to what I've shown you, where it kind of shows how things might get separated. We can see, if you look at the picture in more detail, only two thirds of a hard drive have been used, and we've already got almost a thousand fragmented files, those files would be a lot slower to read because they are separated. And so this software would take a while, but it would rearrange things to make sure they're stored in one block, trying to speed up access to these files.